Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 14th Annual Symposium on Race and Ethnic Studies. My name is Alexander Castanis. I'm a sociology anthropology major, Latin American studies minor, and one of this year's four symposium co-chairs. And my name is Gabriela Nakashima. I am a sociology anthropology major as well with a minor in ethnic studies, and I'm also one of the co-chairs this year. This year's symposium titled Legacy, Race, and Remembrance will broadly explore how race and ethnicity affect how we remember, create, and tell our collective and individual histories. And while words like legacy and remembrance seem tied to the past, we want to ensure everyone that this symposium is also just as focused on how the past informs the present and motivates imagining a more just future. We are so, so excited to welcome you all to this kickoff keynote presentation entitled Visible Legacies, Cultural Continuance Through Art. But before the event begins, we have a few matters of housekeeping to share with you all. At this time, please silence your cell phones, but also feel free during the presentation to tweet using hashtag RWSimpLC. We are also excited to announce for the first year that we have a Snapchat filter. So try not to take too many photos, but you know, Get your friends in there, support the symposium. You can find our Twitter handle and hashtag in the program, and remember to keep following, following us on Facebook. And before we turn the mic over to tonight's moder, oh, excuse me. If you didn't grab a program on your way in, make sure to grab one on your way out. It has the full schedule of all panels and events this week. More information can also be found on our website, which is at listed at the front of the program. Also, please make sure to check out the art exhibit upstairs in STAM while panels are not in session. Before we turn the mic over to tonight's moderator, we want to remind everyone that following this presentation, there will be a question and answer session. We ask that everyone remain seated for this as we will bring microphones to those with their hands raised and ready to ask questions. Additionally, ISLC will be holding office hours every night during the symposium for students who are looking for a space to share, reflect, and talk with others about what they're experiencing at the symposium. This space will be open mainly for international students, but anyone who cares about the relationship between race, ethnicity, culture, and diaspora are welcome to join. On Thursday, international students are invited to drop in at the MRC from 5 to 7 p.m. for a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. And lastly, next Tuesday, November 14th, IME will host a facilitated conversation from 5 to 7 p.m. in STAM. This gathering is for all students who wish to reflect on the symposium events. All right, without further ado, I would like to invite our very own professor who teaches in Latin American studies, Hispanic studies, and ethnic studies, Magali Rabasa, to get tonight's event started. Thank you all so much for coming. Good evening, everyone. Thank you and congratulations to the symposium co-chairs, Alexander, Gabby, Michelle, and Kristen, as well as to Kim Brodkin, Chelsea Jackson, and all the members of the symposium committee. I also would like to thank the Warren family for their ongoing support of the symposium and for their presence here tonight. And I want to acknowledge and thank all of the workers who are essential to this event and to every day here at Lewis and Clark. It's a tremendous honor to share this space with all of you, and especially with our invited speakers, Keone Nunez and Wendy Redstar, from whom we'll hear tonight about the question of visible legacies, cultural continuance through art. The theme of this year's symposium, Legacy, has everything to do with power. Power to make experience, memory, and history visible, as well as to make those aspects of individual and collective life invisible. The podium I'm speaking to you from tonight is a vivid visual expression of one form of power related to legacy. Here, as we see, we have the names of the two pioneers for whom this college was named. And like many of you, I'm reminded of this visible legacy daily as I move around the campus and go about my everyday activities. Email, classrooms, everything has this name on it. But the legacy visibly commemorated by this institution's name is rarely connected with a recognition of the fact that this podium, this building, this campus, this city was built and exists today on unceded territory of the Chinook people. The power that makes one history visible, that of the settler colonialist project in this case, 
is dependent on making another history invisible, in this case, that of the indigenous past and present of this territory. The keynote speakers you'll hear from tonight and engage with a very different kind of power. Through their work with visual culture, they enact diverse modes of collective, productive, and indeed creative power that directly and indirectly contest the histories and legacies that are dominant in mainstream society. Central to both of their practices is a dynamic of intergenerational collaboration. In this and many other ways, the work of Keone Nunez and Wendy Redstar offers exciting possibilities for exploring the notion of legacy. Over the past three decades, Keone Nunez has been a practitioner of kakao, which is Hawaiian tattooing. He describes himself as a traditional tattooist, which means that he uses traditional tools that have been used for tattooing for over a thousand years. Since 2000, Keone has worked exclusively using traditional tools, and he has played a vital role in the recognition and revival of traditional tattoo in the Hawaiian community. But as he himself says, more than being a tattooist, he is a cultural person, a cultural practitioner, with a commitment to perpetuating Hawaiian culture through specific cultural forms. In one interview that I found, he described the historical and contemporary power of the work of kakao, of tattooing. He says, and I quote, it humbles you as a person doing the work because through your hands, your ancestors live. While tattoo becomes, has become his primary focus, he also continues to be very active in other expressions of Hawaiian culture, including as a teacher of hula and a crew member and protocol officer for the P Polynesian Voyaging Society's Voyaging Canoe, Hakulea and Hawaii Iloa. Just as his work extends far beyond tattooing, his influence also extends far beyond Hawaii. An internationally recognized master tattooist, he has traveled to share his knowledge in many parts of the world, and his work has been exhibited in the Smithsonian Institute, the Honolulu Art Museum, the Oakland Museum of California, and the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tongarewa. Portland-based multidisciplinary artist Wendy Redstar was raised on the Crow Reservation in Montana and engages a wide range of creative forms, including photography, sculpture, video, performance, and fiber arts. Her practice as an artist is animated and shaped by her engagement with historical archives and narratives. And in this way, her work explores what she describes as, and I quote, the intersections of Native American ideologies and colonialist structures. Through collaborative work with her 10-year-old daughter, Beatrice Redstar Fletcher, she uses public performance and installations in spaces like the Denver Art Museum, the Portland Art Museum, and the Seattle Art Museum to critique and challenge the institutional power of museums as part of a broader effort to, in her words, decolon decolonize thinking around Native American art. Wendy Redstar received her BFA from Montana State University and her MFA in sculpture from UCLA. In 2015, she was awarded the Emerging Artist Grant from the Joan Mitchell Foundation, and in 2016, she was an artist in residency at the Denver Art Museum. In addition to traveling to dozens of institutions as a visiting lecturer, Wendy Redstar has exhibited in many parts of the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Fondation Cartier pour l'Art Contemporain, my French mother appreciates that moment, <laughs> the Domaine de Kerguenec, perhaps, the Portland Art Museum, the Hood Art Museum, the St. Louis Art Museum, and the Minneapolis Institute of Art, among other spaces. So what's gonna happen tonight is we'll hear presentations from each of our speakers, beginning with Wendy, and then we'll move into a dialogue between the speakers, and then we'll close with a Q&A, inviting all of you to join in the conversation. So please join me in welcoming our speakers to Lewis and Clark. everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me and thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank the students. Um, I think this is a really amazing symposium that you have put together and I'm, like I said, really grateful to be here. The topics are uh, right up my alley. Um, and um, I'm also really excited to um, uh, learn more about the other keynote speakers work in practice as well. Um, 
And thank you for honoring the, uh, and mentioning the territory of the indigenous people here. Um, so I'm gonna get started. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, my collaboration with my daughter, Beatrice Redstar Fletcher. And unfortunately, she's not here tonight. I did uh, ask her if she would come, but she opted to go to Aikido instead. <laughs> um, but we're gonna be doing some uh, speaking uh, next week at uh, Pullman, in Pullman, Washington. Um, so this is uh, Beatrice here, and she is 10 and a, a little bit about what inspires us. So I grew up on the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana, which is in southeastern Montana, very close to the Wyoming border. Um, and the largest city about an hour away is Billings, Montana, which also happens to be the biggest city in Montana. And I grew up immersed in Crow culture. And what you're seeing me uh, do here is Parade at Crow Fair. It's an event that happens every third week in August. Um, and it started in 1904 as a way for the government to get Crow Indians excited um, to be farmers. So they modeled it after the fairs in the Midwest. Um, and then around that time, all sort of native gatherings or ceremonial or cultural things were banned. So they lifted some of those um, so that crows would be interested in coming. So they would show off their cattle and their produce, but then they incorporated parade um, and dancing, and then it's known as the teepee capital of the world. So um, families gather, there about 50,000 people showed up um, from all over the world. Um, and what we do is we uh, parade around the camp every morning, and that represents us moving to a different camp like we used to do back in the day. Um, and what I'm wearing is an elk tooth dress. And uh, both the keynote speakers are wearing um, teeth necklaces, so I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> we got a whale necklace there and we have um, elk teeth that I'm wearing and what I'm sewing on are um, uh, eye teeth, the two eye teeth of an elk, and what the elk tooth dress represents is the hunting ability of the men in your family. And some of these dresses have close to 1,600 teeth, 800 per side. And around the turn of the century, elk were um, becoming extinct, and also crows were um, not allowed to hunt. And so you'll see the dresses now are mostly made of um, synthetic teeth, resin, um, uh, they used to be uh, carved out of bone and wood. And so you'll still see a few real teeth in there, but it still holds that uh, status symbol. And the more elk teeth you have, the better like hunters or trading ability, or in my case, I'm really good at shopping. So, um, <laughs> so here's an image that my dad took in the 70s of Crow Fair and some of the women parading. And then I've also um, take my daughter um, every summer to go to Crow Fair. And so she is, um, what would that be? On the left there. And that was her in 2015 when she was eight. And uh, that is me um, beside her when I was eight years old. And so the Crow um, tribe is matrilineal. So I like to talk about that. And so everything follows uh, your grandmother. And so since my mom is white, I follow my dad's mother. And um, this piece is about that matrilineal line. Um, and a really great thing um, that I like to talk about in this piece is every now and then I'll go on eBay and I'll type in Crow Indian beadwork. And so I did that. Um, in 2015, I was looking at beadwork. Like I said, I'm a really good shopper. And this doll popped up. And without even like looking at the information, I knew that that was a doll that my grandma had made. And uh, I just purchased it. I didn't even see how much it was. 
and it had been a doll that she made, I think in the 80s, and a woman in North Carolina had bought it, and then it came up for sale, and my grandma had passed in, I believe, 2013, and so this doll came in the mail, and it had her handwriting, and another thing my grandma always does is she likes to put underwear on her dolls. So I lifted up the little skirt and there were the underwear. <laughs> and um, I thought that was really amazing. And it made me think about how important art is and that she made this piece. And then I was able to connect with her art years later and even after she had passed away. So we took it to Crow Fair and uh, paraded with it. And it's, it's now in our home. Um, so here is Crow Fair 2016. So I want to talk a little bit about how we got started, which is at the Portland Art Museum in 2014 at an exhibition called Medicine Crow and the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation. And what I was uh, interested in was one of our chiefs, his name is Medicine Crow, and he was 36 years old, the same age as I am. And I noticed that I kept seeing these two images of him being printed on like sacred Indian um, tourist kind of books in the airport, or um, Honest Tea used to have um, the full body image of him, or I would see a lot of artists making images of him when I'd just Google him online, either uh, non-Indian or, or native people using this image. So I knew people were really drawn and attracted to it, but, um, I couldn't help but think, do they actually know who Medicine Crow is? Um, and since growing up on the reservation, I know descendants of Medicine Crow, and uh, I was thinking, I would like to kind of share his story. But the other thing for me is that I didn't actually know uh, what he was doing in this photo. So I asked myself that question. What happened that day when Medicine Crow sat down to take these photos? And what happened was he went to Washington, D.C. in 1880 with six other uh, chiefs, and they were fighting for Crow territory because the government was going to put the railroad through a large chunk of our hunting territory. So he was fighting for our land. And then through that process, I started researching about each individual chief and then also asking questions about their outfit. So I grew up, of course, going to Crow Fair and seeing other uh, men wear the outfits, but it was just something that we did. We didn't really question it. Um, and what I learned was that they were stating who they were as chiefs and what they did to become Crow chiefs. And in order to become a Crow chief, you do four things. Um, you're the first to touch an enemy in combat. You uh, snatch an, a weapon from an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, you steal a horse within an enemy camp and then lead a successful war party. So those things weren't easy, else everybody would be a chief. Um, and we were really good at stealing horses and so good that we stole Lewis and Clark's horses when they came through our territory. So <laughs> <laughs> I always think about that. Um, but I like to talk about this horse thing because at one point we had like close to 90,000 horses and some families had up to 10,000 horses that they would own. Um, but the good horses were always kept in the middle of the camp and then a uh, lead rope with maybe some, something on it that would make sounds was then um, put underneath the teepee and then tied to the owner. So you really had to do some work to get in there, not make noise and steal that horse. And you'll see it in parading. Let's see if I go back. Um, I thought maybe one of these horses, uh, a lot of times will be like a fancy rope around the horse's neck, and that meant that that was a horse, a good horse that got stolen. So you'll see a lot of these translated. Um, so anyways, uh, I was doing that, and I had a bunch of uh, copies of these images, and then I would write down specific information about the outfit. For instance, the uh, white, long kind of strips you, you see, those are ermine. And if they're worn on um, the shirt, that meant that they captured a gun. If they're on their leggings, they, that meant they stole a horse. You'll also notice Medicine Crow um, has kind of a circle around his back. 
and uh, he's wearing hair extensions. So that was another thing I didn't know, that uh, the hair extensions were um, cut from uh, people's hair in mourning, and then they would stitch them uh, together with pine pitch, it's a sap, and uh, crows really liked exaggeration. Long hair meant power. We even had a chief called Chief Long Hair, um, and his hair could wrap around the base of a teepee. Um, so all of these uh, things on their outfit were giving the rank, and they wanted to show the president, like, this is all the things we did, including Medicine Crow has the two bows, you can kind of see on the side of his face. In order to wear those bows, he had to overcome an enemy and slice their throat. So he meant business. So I had all of these, I was doing all the research, um, and then my daughter came up to me, and she wanted to interact, and at that time I was also working a full-time job. And I told her, I can't really do anything, but here's a stack of Xerox copies. <laughs> Go entertain yourself. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out how to uh, close the exhibition. I need one more piece. And so she came back to me with this. And it just made sense that she's the future generation and uh, she's going to be uh, carrying this history through and that I needed her to be in the exhibition. So I asked and I set her up with a studio and she made 20 uh, portraits. And here she is. Um, and as part of that, at the opening, she told me she wanted to talk. And I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> you can, I guess, you're in the show, like, I guess you can talk. And that was when I discovered that she was a really great public speaker, way better than I am, <laughs> um, and, uh, and totally into her stuff. So she did bring her class, um, and I was, at that point, not allowed to say anything, even about my own work. Um, <laughs> And then I decided, well, this is great. This is an opportunity for me to work with my kid, for her to learn about her own history, and for her to teach other people about it. So we've collaborated um, at the Seattle Art Museum. They had an exhibition of the Diker family collection, wh which was uh, called Indigenous Beauty, and it showcased a lot of gorgeous uh, uh, work in their collection, but really no context. Um, so what we did was we, based on a, a series I did called The Four Seasons in 2006, uh, I, we decided to create a diorama for Beatrice, and we called it the Pacific Northwest Season, and uh, she helped with purchasing the animals, and then setting up the actual diorama, and then it was a, a night at the museum where it was open to the public. So we had the public come in, and then um, take photos in the diorama. And then those were then beamed up to the second floor, uh, right at the entrance of indigenous beauty. So people would have to see themselves on display before they saw the native objects on display. We also worked at the Tacoma Art Museum, uh, and we worked with the Haub family collection of, of art of the American West. And the interesting thing about the, ha the Haub family is that they're a German family that moved um, to the US and one of their uh, rules that they have for themselves when they collect uh, Western art is that it can't um, show any violence or depict any violence. And I thought, well, how bizarre. <laughs> it's all about manifest destiny. Um, and so I talked to B about how she wanted to interact with the, the collection because that's what the museum realized that they have a problem. There's not really an indigenous perspective with th that work. Um, and so what we decided to do was pick a few paintings and then B would be like a muse, dress up as a painting, and I would do the alternative fact version. Um, so here we are in our outfits. And we provided rose-colored uh, glasses so everyone would be extra safe. And also, um, we provided name tags with all the different um, indigenous nations that were depicted in the, in the works. And so, here's uh, B and I getting ready um, to talk about George Washington. 
And then recently, we just ended a residency, our first artist residency at the Denver Art Museum. And uh, with this, uh, I decided that um, I wanted B to really have an education and talk with the different curators. But uh, B wanted to do a tour specifically for children. And so we set her up with her own little name tag and then we set her loose in the museum and then she selected uh, objects that she was interested in and then we would have a curator or a docent come and give her uh, uh, a talk about the work. So here she is in the contemporary native arts section. Uh, we also got a, a tour of the collections, which is my, one of my favorite things to do. Anytime I go to a museum um, anywhere, like I was just in uh, Tulsa, um, I asked to see their collection and if they have any crow objects. And I've seen crow objects almost in every city that I go to. Um, so that's something to me I always, people will ask, well, how do you feel about that? Um, in a way, I feel sort of comforted because I'm getting to see my ancestors' work, but I'm also getting to engage with it. But I also do find it very, um, just really odd how much of our material culture is spread out across this continent. Um, so as part of the tour, uh, B um, decided that she wanted her own tour guide outfit. So she drew an image and then I sewed her up a nice tour guide outfit. And then she uh, went ahead and did three tours and then also provided activities for the kids. So here's some of those activities. And we will be giving another tour at, in Pullman, Washington at uh, the museum that, that's there um, next Thursday, I believe. So she's got a new tour guide outfit and we're just going to continue. <laughs> um, working with different institutions and their collections. So, thank you. Thank you for inviting me um, to come and talk with all of you guys uh, about this really important aspect of culture that a lot of people don't know about. Um, you know what? Hawaii has the largest population of Hawaiians and Polynesians in the entire US. Second is California. Yeah, makes sense. You know what the third largest population of Polynesians is? Where? Huh? Not Utah. Texas. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, but you know what the fourth largest population is? The Pacific Northwest. You guys got more Hawaiians and Polynesians over here than 46 other states in the, in the nation, including Utah, including Nevada. 
but you don't see us. So sometimes inclusion is not just seeing who's around us, but seeing who's missing, who's not at the table. Because when they're not at the table, but they're here, something's wrong. So I talk about tattoos because tattooing is something that is very near and dear to my heart. When I first started doing work, I was taught by several Hawaiian elders that included my family members. They taught me the cultural part of it. And so in 1990, I started tattooing. Um, and I tried to make traditional tools. Because to me, there were too many tattooists out in the world. Uh, I wanted to do something that was reflective of who I am as an individual. With terrible, terrible results. <laughs> because traditional tools are hard to use. It wasn't until this gentleman came into my life. And this gentleman came into my life not through our connections as, as uh, Polynesians, but this Dutchman by the name of Hank Schiffmacher, Hanky Panky from Amsterdam, came through Hawaii and was doing a documentary of um, traditional tattooing. And he included me with the documentary. And he went over to New Zealand and he was talking with Paulo Sulope, who at that time was the best traditional tattooist who lived. And he told him about me. And I met him. And he asked me if I wanted to be his student. And that's the start of my journey in doing traditional tattooing. Now, you might not think that it's a big deal, you know, somebody teaches you. In Samoa, you don't teach anybody who is not family. Because the Samoan tattooing families go back 4,000 years to the time of Taima and Tila Fainga, two women, twins that swim, swam from Fiji to Samoa to give the tools to his ancestors so it was a big thing. It was a huge thing. And so I learned from him as much as I could from 1996 to 1999. He unfortunately died in November of 1999. And uh, his death was, was earth shaking because it wasn't something that anyone expected. He was killed by his wife because she was jealous that he was going to leave him or her. And so for a while, I didn't tattoo at all until he came to me in a dream. And he told me, Keone, I didn't teach you for nothing. And it was then that I realized that I needed to continue this legacy that he handed to me. In 2001, I was afforded uh, the, the great honor of carrying his name as a title. So I went to Samoa and I, I had a, 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 a title ceremony that gave me a chiefly title of Sulawape, of being a sacred tattooist from the Sasu Alliance that goes back 4,000 years. And I didn't do it for myself, but I did it for my students so that they would have that legacy. Now, when you talk about tattooing, you don't ta talk about these things. Because for many, many people, it's artistry. It is something that you go into a shop, you pick out what you want, and you get it tattooed on your body. That was never the case in Polynesia. In Polynesia, it was the designs were picked out by myself or whoever is the tattooist. Because you would never go into a hospital and tell the doctor, hey, you know what, doctor, I think I get cancer right back here. Yeah, you wouldn't do that because 
they have to examine you, they have to talk to you, they have to take tests, then they can determine what you have. So why is it that you would go into a shop and tell somebody, I want this tattoo that's gonna last on your body for the rest of your life, unless you get it lasered, but that's kind of ugly. Um, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you tell the person, this is who I am. This is what's important to me. Why don't you design something that would be meaningful for me and me alone, and not one out of thousands of other types of tattoos that are out there? So it's a different perspective. It's a different way of thinking. Oh, wrong way. This is Hawaiian, bold, dark lines that covers a person pretty much from head to toe, if you want. Another type of tattoos, now not all tattoos were always bold. You had to make adjustments for the type of individuals that, are, that you're doing work on. This is an interesting picture because you see those half, half uh, circles. Anthropologists has, have always said that with the type of tools that I have, you know, I, I'll bring some tools up afterwards, you can never make round designs. Nobody told me about that. <laughs> Again, if you look at the designs, they're very bold. They're very strong designs. that are reflective not of the whim of an individual. And all of these designs are picked by me, not by them. But when you look at it, it matches who they are. And it matches the physique. The long tattoos, the alaniho tattoos, this one done on a, a woman, and it doesn't matter as far as gender is concerned. Both genders got work done. And it can look quite lovely. There are a couple things that, that really irritate me because um, there is assumptions. And one of the assumptions is if you use traditional tools, it hurts a lot. Moana did that whole thing. On, you guys have seen Moana? <laughs> terrible, terrible. Anyway, they did that whole thing on how much it hurts. It hurts less than the machine in the right hand. The second assumption is that it takes a long time. You know how long it took me to do this, uh, this uh, EV lay? We call this type of design EV lay. It took maybe 45 minutes at most. So it's actually quicker and less painful than machine. And sometimes we think that, oh, you know what? Because it's traditional, because it's ancient, it must not be as good as what we have today. I challenge anybody to go to the pyramids and say you can build the same thing as uh, the same way that they did and make it look as good. Yeah. I challenge any one of you to go out and make a fish hook using the same materials to fashion it, or even using metal, and looking at it next to a museum piece and seeing that it is just as good as that. It's never gonna happen. Sometimes our traditional techniques that are lost, unfortunately, is lost because we do not appreciate it. Yeah. This is Wang Od. Wang Od, uh, I've been to visit her twice. And we became very close. I'm not Filipino. Um, but the first time I went to visit Wang Od was because I read an article on her. And in the article, they asked, uh, do you think you would be continuing this tradition of tattooing 
onto the next generation. And when they wrote the article, she was already in her 90s. So she said, I'm not sure how long I have left on this earth. So it might be that if I get sick and I go, then the sound of tattooing will be gone forever in our forests. It got to me when I read that. So I made it a point to go and visit her. Not to get a tattoo from her or anything of that nature, because everybody wanted to do that, but to sit in front of her and to tattoo so that she could see that there was another culture that had very similar traditions. When she saw that, she cried. And she asked me, why do people come to me? You're a lot faster. <laughs> I said, because you're Wang Od. You are the person that people need to go to. So her and I became really, really close. And she shared with me a lot of designs. And I've done some designs. And I do it with really, really deep respect because there's this whole thing about cultural appropriate uh, uh, appropriations that I really, really hate, okay? Again, Moana. All the tattoos on there is just terrible. But you know what's even worse in Moana is not the tattoos. There's this song, Loimata e Malingi, that all of you have heard that's in that, that, if you saw that movie, you've heard it twice. And the context is so out of place that it just hurts. It's, it's that song when Moana as an infant uh, goes out into the ocean uh, chasing um, this shell. And there's a song that comes out. Loi Mata e Malingi is a Tokelauan song. Nobody knows where the Tokelaus are, but you hear that song. Tokelau is part of America, believe it or not, um, part of American Samoa. At least part of the islands are. That song was written to honor 19 women, young women, who died in a fire in the school dormitory. I mean, Loi Mata means tears. And yet they appropriate that song and put it in a place that's not where it should be. Or they use it when it shouldn't be used. And so you have this whole culture of appropriation. And we just as guilty of it as, as anybody else, as Polynesians. Because we appropriate tattoo designs to a point where, you know, there's this one guy that don't, if you get Polynesian tattoos and you don't want to get your feelings hurt, don't ask me, <laughs> yeah, because he asked me, oh, what do you think of my tattoos? And, oh, don't ask me. And I said, no, 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 I, I really want to know what you think. I said, oh, uh, so I looked at him. He looked at me, huh? He, he was still kind of, you know, didn't know what, uh, what to say. And uh, again, he couldn't respond. I said, so how come you have Samoan, Tahitian, and Maori tattoos, and you can't understand what I said? Just because you're Hawaiian doesn't mean that you can appropriate other people's designs. Because it's not appropriate for you. Get your own designs. Do your own designs. And if it wasn't for Wang Od, 
I would never have done tat uh, Filipino tattoos. And this is an example of one that I did do. And this is so interesting because Baguio Museum curator calls me up. Oh, she didn't call me up. She messaged me on Facebook. Facebook is a wonderful thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she messaged me on Facebook and because I was tagged on this picture by this gentleman. His name is Chris Duque. He, he, he's touched your lives, whether you realize it or not. In the late 70s and 80s, he was the one that created the protocols for um, child predators online. He started it in Hawaii, and it went across the nation. He teaches the FBI. He teaches other countries. Uh, what to do. Uh, amazing man. Um, when Chris asked me if I would do something like this on him, um, I made sure that I visited Wang Od and asked her, and she gave me permission to do this. Um, this is a very powerful piece for anyone who is Filipino, who comes from the northern part of the Philippines. And I was very honored to be able to do this. Um, if it wasn't for that, I would never have done it. But I always ask permission. Uh, I had the opportunity to work on some Yurok, uh, Karuk, um, Talwat, and Hupa women. And before I worked on them, I asked them permission. And I asked them, why do you want me? I mean, really, <laughs> I'm from Hawaii. Why do you want me to do these, one, what they call, well, everybody else calls 111s, yeah, on their chin? Very significant designs. And I tattooed over 20 of them. I asked them, why do you want me? And the answer wasn't given to me right off. What happened was, at the potlatch, um, there was a song that came out. And the women that I tattooed came up and danced. And the guy that I asked the question to came up and sat next to me. And he said, do you know what this dance is about? I said, no, I, I don't understand uh, the language. And he says, this is why we wanted you. And I, I didn't understand. And he said, this song is a very joyous song. And this song is about when the first white women came to our area. They were overjoyed because that meant that our women stopped being raped. Our men stopped being killed. Our lands went back not back to us, but was not taken anymore. He said, do you think that these special, unique designs, we don't want them to be put on by a machine that was created by the same people that slaughtered our men, that raped our women, that took away our lands. We wanted it from native hands. And so it made sense at that time. This is how I tattoo. The sticks has their own voice, and every tattooist has their own song. And this is a song that Paolo Suluape gave to me. For those of you who are familiar with tattooing, this is, the next slide is something that you can never ever see from machine tattooists. Oh, this. You can never get that deep into the eye without tearing the skin apart. And it takes a skilled hand to do it. But 
This is how we continue our legacy of tattooing. From myself that was given these tools and given the title to my students. And our apprenticeship is not one, two, three years. It's an apprenticeship for life. Because until I die, they will always be my students. Thank you. Sorry, I said I would show you my tools, so. But why you think I'm a liar? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you both so much. So we're gonna open up a bit of conversation uh, between Wendy and Keone here on some of the topics that um, were raised by their presentations. And then we'll open up the floor to questions from all of you and comments. Um, so I just wanted to start uh, with a theme that was raised um, and which I think really enhances our understanding of the title of the session about cultural continuance. Um, I think what both of your presentations made really evident is the way that cultural continuance is a very dynamic process, right? It's not about preservation. It's not about um, maintaining the purity of something as it was only in the past, but rather it's about that intergenerational process and about the contemporary experience. We saw this, uh, Wendy, in your comments about seeing the material culture of the Crow people spread out across this vast territory and how that's something that leaves you conflicted. It's not just bad, right? Um, it's something that you learn from and learn with that experience of encountering um, that culture in surprising spaces sometimes. Um, but we also see how being a contemporary Native artist is something really particular. Working with your daughter brings these surprising moments also into that practice of cultural continuance. Um, with Keone, you talk about appropriation and the loss that occurs um, when things are taken out of context and taken uh, out of their meaning. But you also talk about the tremendous effect of working and learning in Samoa and in the Philippines, right? Um, and the way that culture moves and shifts, right? So I was hoping that we could maybe talk a bit more about this because really central to this again is the question of power, right? Mm -hmm. That question of asking permission, that mm -hmm. question of asking hard questions when you're in that collections room, face to face with curators at a museum. Um, so. One way would be to talk more sort of about your experiences with these institutional spaces like museums, right? You've both worked extensively in museum spaces. Museums are the space of legacy, right? They're the space of history. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that's looked like, um, the different ways that you've engaged in museum spaces, the different questions that it's raised for you, and sort of how, you, how you've engaged that. You go first. Oh. Um. Yeah, I've been fortunate enough to, to work with some really, really unique museums, uh, including Peabody Museum in Salem, and um, several of the museums have, have uh, things uh, that I've made, uh, including uh, the Smithsonian, including Peabody Museum, including uh, uh, Te Papa o Tongareva, in the, the National Museum in New Zealand and uh, the Stuttgart Museum in Germany. Um, and it's interesting because when they ask me things, sometimes I have fun with them. I really do, I have fun with them. Um, there was this, this uh, head that was carved out of um, gum from the uh, kauri tree which is uh, from New Zealand, it's a pine. So the gum was carved into a head. And so I don't know nothing about that. I mean, I'm not Maori, so I don't know about that. And so this uh, German um, museum director asked, was, asked me, what can you tell me about this? So I was like, I'm not Maori, so you know, in my mind, I was thinking, I'm not Maori, so, so I said, oh, you know what? What they do is they carve the tattoo on this face, and they do prayers, 
and they burn the, 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 uh, the gum. And so in these prayers, that tattoo on the face transfers over to the person that they're working on. <laughs> then he was like, oh my goodness. I said, nah, nah, I was just joking, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes um, they have to understand what your expertise is. They can't feel that you speak for everybody. I don't speak for every Hawaiian. I mean, there's people out here that, you know, you know, you could never say that I am totally speaking for everyone who's a male or everyone who's a female or everyone in my ethnic uh, uh, community. You can't do that. But sometimes museum people don't quite understand that. Yeah. And so it's been challenging, but for the most part, I've had fun with it. Yeah. That's such a good point, because I, I think a lot of um how uh, people of color get put in that position as sort of the advocate for your whole uh, community, mm -hmm. which is unfair. But it also takes a big person to not take that position and uh, let museum curators know that you don't know. Mm. And I actually really value that when somebody says that, because um, that's where things get really messed up and cataloged the mm -hmm. wrong way. <laughs> I mean, you could have had that story in that museum um, go on for centuries or something. <laughs> yep. Um, but I, what I've noticed is that I get uh, approached um, by curators who are curating the native galleries and, and museums. And, um, and what I'm starting to see, which I think is progress, is that they realize that they actually don't even though they're displaying all um, indigenous objects, that they know that uh, there isn't actually an indigenous voice there because they've all been um, written about by non-indigenous people or displayed by non-indigenous people. Um, so oftentimes I'll get asked to come in and um, check things out, which I really love to do. Um, and I think that's a step forward. Um, that there, there is a recognition that they're missing that voice. Um, so it happens sometimes where I'll be approached or, for instance, if I go to lecture, like I was just in, um, at uh, Northern Iowa University, and I asked them, do you have anything Crow in your collection? And they had like two things, and they were really bad examples of Crow things. <laughs> um, but they still had some crow stuff, so it's, it's a lot of fun for me. Um, another theme that was really um, powerful in both of your presentations and, and just more broadly in your work is the question of intergenerational connections, which we've talked about a bit already. Um, but I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more to this. You know, Keone, you mentioned when you talked about um, uh, being given that chief title. You said you didn't do it for yourself, you did it for your students, right? And much of the work that you do, you talk about the decisions that you make as being decisions that you make for your daughter, right? Because of what that will mean for her and what that will enable her to continue to do. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about those intergenerational connections and sort of how they play out, why they're so significant, um, what it means to do something for your students, right? You can go first this time. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, with the, that exhibition, Medicine Crow and the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation, it traveled for two years, which was really great to see it in different institutions. And what I would ask um, each institution if they could um, connect, either if they were like in a museum or at a university, to connect with um, a collection, and if they had Crow objects, to place them. And, and so I, I consider that kind of working with my ancestors in an intergenerational way. But it, the, that show ended in Bellings, Montana, which was where I was born and very close to my reservation. And um, it was at Montana State University in Bellings, and they actually had original drawings that Medicine Crow made 
when he returned from Washington, D.C., all from his memory, which was really cool. Um, so it depicted him riding the train and um, different boats and the Capitol. And it also, they took them to the circus. <laughs> so he had all these like circus animals. Um, and so we were able to get those framed and then placed in the exhibition. So it felt very much like a three-person show with my work and his work. And it was just very surreal to know that he drew those in 1880 and that they were in the exhibition. And then uh, to have uh, my daughter's work in there as well. And I showed you images of my dad's work. Um, well, not, not his work. Um, but slides he took in the 70s of Crow Fair. And so I'll use old family photographs. And in that way, I also feel like it's a collaboration. Um, so I really enjoy working that way. And with Beatrice, she's tweening really hard right now. And I'm not cool at all on the playground. I get ditched. Um, so I'm pretty flexible with where we're at in our collaboration. And when I'm super not cool, um, I'm okay with whatever she decides, you know, if she wants to do it or not. But oftentimes I'll ask her, I'll tell her I have something coming up and then she'll tell me if she wants to do it or not. Yeah, for me, the intergenerational thing just goes beyond that of just um, my elders and things like that. Uh, Paulo Suluape passed away in 2000, in 1999, and um, he still teaches. It's, oh, there it is. It went on and off. Uh, I learn every, every time I ask a question, and the question doesn't, the answer doesn't come right off the bat. It comes when I'm open to it. So when I'm driving or when I'm not thinking about it, when I'm washing dishes or something, then the answer comes to me. Um, so it's not just intergenerational in the way that people categorize it. Um, I worked with, I have six, I had six students. I graduated one of them. Um, so I have five more, and that's all I'm going to work with because I'm, I'm getting old. I'm 60, and so I, do, I can't bring on more students. And, you know, it's amazing because I get asked all the time via email and stuff like that from tattooists on the continental U.S. to give, get them if they can apprentice under me. But their idea of apprenticeship is a year or two our reality of apprenticeship is a lifetime. And so they don't quite understand that. And so I just start emailing them in Hawaiian and I said, well, translate this first and <laughs> maybe, maybe we can talk, you know, and that never happens. They, they automatically stop. Um, but I think that it's up to me to teach them as best as I can and to allow enough time for that to mature. And so that's, that's real different, I guess, yeah. 